topic, how banks and financial institutions are making the most of AI, which will continue to 2.30 Jakarta time. This panel discussion will cover personalized customer experience, which has been a key contributor to the banking sector, how AI and data analytics improves financial institutions, how ML can help banks to rate credit risk, understanding AI's increasing impact on insurance, and AI can quickly consume and process a massive amount of data at an expedited rate. Well, for this, our panelists, our eminent panelists, first up is uh, Mohammad uh, Jafari, the Vice President of uh, Digital Banking Division, PT Bank uh, Rakyat, Indonesia. Well, Mohammad leads uh, several initiatives of AI powered products, services, and solutions in progressing towards the digital transformation. Before joining uh, BRI, uh, Jafari was the head of AI at the Bukala Park responsible for delivering AI solutions that support some technical and business domains. We're also joined by Sony Supriyadi, the SVP Head Pricing and Data Analytics, Maybank, Indonesia. A versatile pricing professional and an international speaker with global uh, exposure, he's uh, somebody who thrives in a challenging environment. Sony has led uh, global projects in many countries to leading local organizations for their business and process transformation. We're also joined by Alexander Kurt, the Chief Data Officer Alliance uh, Indonesia. Alexander specializes in establishing AI, ML, business uh, intelligence and digital transformation at Alliance Innovation Lab while, while, while driving changes in an organization and its culture. We also are joined by Vishal Tulsian, the founder, CEO, PT Bank Amar Indonesia. Vishal is the founder of the first fintech in Indonesia. He's also the president director of the PT Bank Amar Indonesia TBK. And he's somebody who's a keynote speaker and an author, and he's an MBA chartered accountant and, and an a Harvard alumni. We're also having uh, Krill uh, Odin Swove, the head of data science, home credit Indonesia. Well, uh, Krill, an experienced uh, mathematician with a first-hand experience with modeling projects all over the world, both on-site and remotely on diverse sets of data. And ladies and gentlemen, this entire conversation is going to be moderated by Dr. James Ong, Managing uh, Director, Artificial Intelligence Institute, International Institute, which is the AIIII, SEA, and uh, China. Well, uh, James, uh, ha Dr. James has 30 plus years of experience in consulting clients across Asia, the US and Europe on digital transformation across multiple generations of technology evolution. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we couldn't be much more elated to have these uh, eminent panelists joining us with this. I'd request you all to please switch on your cameras and join us on the main stage. Also to all our valued attendees, if you may have any questions for our esteemed panel, Please do type it in the Q&A tab. We'll be passing it on to Dr. James to take it forward to his panel, uh, if time allows, towards the end. With this, uh, over to you, Dr. James, with your eminent panel. Thank you very much, Bawana. I'm, this is James Ong here. I'm so happy to be back to Indonesia's biggest AI conference. Uh, I hosted this before last year. This year is getting even more exciting with our distinguished panel of uh, experts. Uh, as many of you know, Indonesia government has announced the Indonesia 4.0 roadmap, which is making AI as a strategic plan, just like many of the major uh, power, US, uh, China, as well as Singapore on the neighbor. So today we're going to talk about uh, banking and financial services and how our panel experts are making great use of AI. I'm actually very excited to talk to them and I hope we will have a good time today. Uh, as, as a start, I would like to invite each of our panel members to have two to three minutes to share a little bit about themselves, especially in AI, what their companies, uh, institutions are doing in AI, as well as what are the uh, priority, what they are working on. Just a simple introduction. So maybe I'll start with the order with uh, Sunny from Maybank. Sunny, you want to do an intro? I think you're, you're muted, Sunny. Okay, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, my name is Sonis Priyadi. I'm currently leading uh, a division called Pricing and Data Analytics. So Data Analytics, uh, one of the divisions, uh, one of the department where AI also focus uh, as one of the priority in the Maybank. 
although it's quite new, uh, but we are, uh, I think, as many other banks that you just started, uh, we have to run rather than walk. So learn very fast uh, in getting uh, the new technology, uh, the new engine. Uh, it is not for us, but also for our customers and our partners. Uh, so that's it from me. Thank you very much. You're still muted, James. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Sunny. Uh, Alex, you want to do a self intro? Yeah, sure. I have you to take over. So, hi, everyone. This is Alex from Allianz. Uh, so, I have been overseeing and driving the digital transformation here at Allianz for the past few years. And while we were initially focusing on the digitization and automation of our core insurance processes, so we are now also then looking into the whole topic of data. And so for me, let's say the responsibility here is not only about looking into AI solutions and making progress on that end, but we are actually looking at data uh, holistically, right? Because for me, uh, let's say AI solutions is, so to say, only more or less a bit the icing on the cake because I think it needs a lot of uh, also transformational activity in, in order to really enable that. So yeah, I'm really talking about really like data quality, data governance. So this falls under my responsibility. Okay, anyway, wonderful, you Alex, good. Uh, Kirill, you want to share about your background? Sure. Uh, hi all, thank you very much for inviting me for this panel. So my name is Kirill Odinsov. I'm head of data science in Honkert, Indonesia. Homecut Indonesia is basically an international company. We are in 10 countries. In total, on our database, we have around 135 million clients. So we have quite enough data to work with. And specifically in Indonesia, we have 9,000 employees. And uh, we are the leading uh, lender of consumer electronics in Indonesia. And uh, why do we need data science? Basically, what, what we are aiming to do, we are trying to be a good shopping partner for our customer, right? And for this, we are trying to make the customer journey as convenient and as fast as possible, right? And also we want to provide a lending to customer who are otherwise underbanked. And for both of these, we need quite a lot of modeling and data science. Uh, for me personally, I, before joining the Honkret Indonesia, I worked in HQ where I was also doing modeling, but there I had more risk background. So more like risk modeling, prediction of default and stuff like this. Um, here in Indonesia, I think what is also very interesting, we are helping all other departments, not only risk with, with data science. So we have quite interesting applications. Thank you. Thank you, Kirill. We have a lot more questions to ask you later on. Uh, Visha, uh, the entrepreneurs, the fintech entrepreneur become banker. Love to hear Hi. your story. Uh, thanks, thanks, James. Yes, so, so we, have the, uh, we have the fortune, uh, fortune and distinction of you first. So we are the first fintech of Indonesia, digital lender to Naiku. We are the first fintech to acquire a bank, yeah, we, which we acquired and then transformed it digitally. So now it has become a digital bank. We are also in that case, the first to get listed. We, last year we got listed. And now just five, six months back, we have launched uh, the first mobile only digital end-to-end -end digital banking, which is called Sanyumku. So uh, Amar Bank is the your play digital bank with two products, Tonaiku, which is digital lending, and Sanyumku, which is mobile banking. Excellent, Visha. Uh, love to talk to you a lot more. Uh, Mohammed, Dr. Mohammed Grifari from uh, Bank Rakyat, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor to be in this panel. And uh, first of all, actually, on behalf of Mr. Kaspar Sitomoran, uh, he sincerely apologized that he couldn't make this discussion due to another urgent matter, just in case you guys actually expect him to be here. So my name is uh, Gifari. I'm the VP of Digital Banking Development in Bank Rakyat Indonesia. That actually uh, dealing with uh, some product development initiatives uh, from, uh, you know, um, uh, that actually uh, are part with AI or machine learning capabilities. And then uh, two examples of our products are uh, Cheria and Pinang, which is actually digital lending platforms. Uh, to uh, our um, customers, uh, either for the retails and also for the you know agro, agricultural customers, basically. And as some of you might already know, that uh, Bank Rakyat Indonesia is uh, the oldest and also one of the largest banks in Indonesia, with seven more than ninety million customers, most of which are the micro segments, and also more than two hundred k employees. And we also have like over ten thousand uh, office branches as well. 
And uh, we started our journey of digital transformation uh, back in 2017, where the vision is to be, you know, moving from the branch-based uh, uh, bank to the branchless bank, which actually, uh, you know, uh, moving towards the mobile first and API first uh, bank, meaning the office, the office branch is not going to be our center of the universe anymore, while the mobile device and then its interconnectivity will be the center of the universe. And at that time, we realized that our essential advantage is the abundance of data. And that's actually the enabler for uh, why we actually doing AI and machine learning on the top of the, uh, the data uh, itself. And a little bit of my personal background, after finishing my PhD in machine learning and computer visions, uh, I actually worked with a visual effect company that actually, um, uh, you know, producing visual effects from uh, for, for the big movies like, you know, uh, maybe War of Depend of the Apes, uh, or the last one is the Avenger End Games. Uh, uh, you know, one of the projects that actually uh, include AI is about facial motion capture, transferring the actual actor's motion into the 3D character movement, which is actually unrelated to the bank application. But after that, uh, I work with Bukalapak, uh, focusing on, uh, you know, uh, building some AI-based application for improving customer experience and also uh, cybersecurity applications. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Kivari has a very interesting background. He has done big movie uh, with AI. He has done e-commerce. Now he's in the bank. So he's representing what I call the new talent uh, going back to Indonesia to contribute to the digitization of the economy. So very glad to be uh, talking to you. Uh, I've actually spoken with all of you. Actually, I learned a lot from our prior conversation. Also, as a continuation from the prior panel, right? There has been a lot of discussion about the banking industry are being uh, heavily regulated, but Indonesia is also a growing economy with digitization. And there's also a lot of discussion about bank versus fintech, etc. Uh, we're going to cover that part later on. I'll keep it as a selling point for to keep our audience to participate. I want to go to the first topic, which is a little bit more traditional, which is like how would a bank, which is under a lot of uh, regulatory requirement, but also with a different demographic of population where you need to uh, cater for population who are, uh, who are unbanked, who are becoming going to be banked, right? I'd love to hear from you from the institutional perspective, how, uh, what kind of innovation you are doing to adopt AI and what are your, how do you look at this whole problem and how do you prioritize what you want to in, uh, digitize using AI? So uh, I'm going to just pick uh, maybe Kirill. Uh, Kirill, you want to start first? Yep, yeah. sure. Uh, like from, from us in home credit, it's, um, we, we are trying to actually apply the, the AI in, in much more perspective because like, for example, let's say in scoring, right? Standard scoring many years, it was only logistic regression, right? Honestly speaking, applying more advanced methods to logistic regression, it helps, like for example, we can start doing XGBoost, LGBM, all these newer methods for potentially even deep learning. But this is not what drives such a huge difference, right? More the difference what we're trying to drive is by having more data and data from very different providers, right? So for example, standardly, I have to ask a client a lot of questions, right? I have to ask, what's your income? What's your, uh, you know, some other information, right? Uh, so it will take time and it will be not fully reliable, right? Because obviously, like for example, fraudsters might, might lie, right? So instead of asking the client, we found find a partner who is of course, uh, um, uh, who, who is allowed by OJK to share the data with us. And based on this, they share us the data and we actually check it ourselves, not, not bothering our client. And at the same time, uh, not knowing the information we need for the approval, right? So I this see. is, I would say one big point. And other big points is other departments, right? Whereas in, for example, credit risk, people long time ago were just like people deciding who to give credit to and who not to, right? It's very manual process, very subjective. Now it's doing by a model, right? So we want to do the same for other departments, CRM, HR, marketing. Okay, interesting. I'm going to uh, go from your question to Visha. I'm going to start with people with no data first to lots of uh, to company like uh, Bank Raya or Maybank or even Alia, you get lots of data because you have a lot of legacy system, right? Exactly. You have different set of challenges. So Vishal, maybe you want to comment on your experience and what? how do you go about? I know you have some very interesting story. So, 
Right, right. Allah, I'll add on to what Kirill said, uh, that uh, AI in the bank can be used, you see, in two ways. Yeah. One is like scoring. I would categorize in a way that one which improves the existing system and processes, it brings in efficiency. So like you can better price the risk. So that's an improvement or, you know, which you can do because of AI. Second is that you can create something new. So like uh, uh, you can now lend to somebody whom you couldn't have lent earlier. That is an addition. So uh, as you said, now the data, for an example, which BRI and Maybank would have is we call it like a structured data, which the customers themselves gave at some point of time. Mm. There the efficiency can be applied, but if somebody doesn't have any data and there is no credit file, then uh, we cannot apply the traditional risk models. And that is where AI can use the alternate data to provide a new product. Uh, in the case of the new product also as a financial institutions, we can provide them a new a learning for the product, like in case of Alliance, suppose uh, insurance product, uh, you can learn about the user that which insurance will benefit them. Uh, in a traditional way, we possibly would be just asking them, what do you need? Mm. Uh, but today AI can be used to actually understand them and provide them a better product, which would be more useful. So, so there are various ways where the AI can be used. And I think we are just starting there. Sure, in fact, uh, okay, I'm gonna come back to both of you. Uh, especially when you talk about unbanked, they have no data, right? Let's go and shift the focus to the big guys, right? Maybe uh, to Sunny, you're a foreign bank, right? Basically, right? Uh, I'm sure you have collected, I don't know how many years Maybank has been in Indonesia, uh, how much data you got, and then what did you do with the data? You can unmute, thank you. Yes, uh, absolutely. I think I think uh, the previous speakers, either Vishal and also Kirill is absolutely correct about that. Uh, data is one of the biggest asset for banks, I guess. Uh, Maybank, prior to Maybank, it is a BII. It's quite long uh, history, not as long as Bank Rakyat Indonesia, of course, because <laughs> it's quite <laughs> different. <laughs> we have different segments on the market. But in terms of data, yes, that's one of the challenge, I guess, uh, when we are talking about this, uh, the legacy system. Uh, not only the engine, but also the, the character of the data itself that what we need, you know, AI is data hungry. We all know about that. If we, if we you know, have a tiny bit of data, we don't need AI, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> and then uh, initially all the analytics are focusing on answering the question, where are we? What's going on with this root cause and so on. And mm. AI tried to move forward What's going to happen? More predictive, more prescriptive. This requires a lot of changing in terms of people expectations. And not only just the technology, of course, technology is part of it, but also people, the, the, the person behind it. Uh, so we need to change that perspective. How can we replace the old paradigm with the new paradigm? Why this expectation is needed? Why do we need to understand people's value? How we get that perceived value from our uh, customers without, without which it will be difficult uh, mm. to set up product. So uh, that kind of thing is, is important for us. So not only platform, not only process, but also we push onto people as well. So that's as a thing that's coming from Maybank. I see, I see. Maybe I also pose similar question later on to uh, Mohammed and Alexis the following. You are a, such a big organization with so much data. You're so busy dealing with what you got, you know, like what uh, Visha and Kirill has mentioned, right? There are a lot of people who are uninsured, who are actually doesn't have any data or unbanked, right? Uh, so how would you actually balance your priority, right? Maybe uh, Dr. Gifari, you want to comment on that before we get to Alex? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so first of all, uh, uh, as uh, I mentioned in the first uh, place that, you know, uh, our biggest segment is in the micro segments. That's basically uh, where uh, we try to, you know, exploit the um, the AI, uh, you know, benefits to that segments. Which actually uh, we focus on the two, uh, you know, directionalities. The first one is the 
kind of a risk management framework, more robust risk management framework is basically related to what Kirill and Pichal said before uh, regarding, you know, better credit scoring uh, with also, uh, you know, combining both financial and also the alternative data. And also secondly, which is also uh, the same importance uh, is the customer acquisitions or like a lead management system to the, um, you know, our sales officer, that's what we call it mantri in Bahasa Indonesia, that actually focusing on, you know, trying to acquire new customers from the micro segments as well as you know uh, doing the you know uh, retentions and then at, in in that uh, direction which basically is kind of like the hybrid approach between you know um, human uh, you know try to um, yeah, basic, uh, definitely they have the the you know the knowledge for acquiring uh, and then providing good products to the customers uh, at the same time we try to, you can use kind of like recommender system, like to find the needle in the haystacks is because from the lot of customers, we would like to help them to find, you know, like maybe the top 10 best customers that they can visit or uh, phone call uh, for, for a day. And it will help us to actually to do uh, this process more efficiently. That's actually one of the, uh, the approach and then, you know, uh, in, in, that, in that directions, uh, obviously the customer profiling or uh, customer, uh, you know, uh, acquisition modeling will be uh, play a big part in there, and also the churn uh, prediction modeling as well, in order to uh, predict uh, whether a particular customer is actually um, has a you know probability of you know exiting from 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 the bank. But uh, you know we would like to uh, you know mitigate that and then to help the uh, sales officers. Uh, to basically follow follow up based on those scoring models. Okay, I see. Alex, you want to comment from the insurance industry perspective? Sure, sure, we'll do that. So yeah, I mean, if you look at insurance business, right? So you will basically see three key pillars in terms of the activity, right? Um, so we primarily talk about a customer onboarding, right? So and all the related activity, it's about the servicing aspect and as well then our so-called moment of truth, which is the um, claims handling, right? And uh, let's say the exciting aspect about uh, um, AI is that uh, we can really identify easily really a lot of use cases in each of these pillars, right? So, and that of course uh, uh, makes me really getting excited about what's ahead of us. Um, but as I said, for me, there's always, uh, you know, we need to look at it holistically. And when we look, talk about, for example, uh, onboarding and customer onboarding, the sales aspect, yes, indeed. I mean, uh, insurance still is, uh, uh, I mean, in a kind of infancy, right? So we only have uh, like uh, five percent uh, um, market coverage here, where we say, okay, um, so insurance as such is still a, a kind of a there's a lot of potential in the market, right? But of course, you don't want to blindly go out and just simply acquire customers, right? You also want to be a bit selective, and this is of course where let's say new methodologies can be applied that you say is we are totally talking about the risk assessment, right? So where AI can definitely help, right? To so, so to say, um, select the customer base that you want to onboard here, right? But of course, the big potential is also then in how you want to to process your cases, right? So when we talk about back office activity, right? So this is where AI also can help a lot uh, in terms of really having a, a, a lean and seamless experience also for the customer later on, right? And this of course really uh, and yeah allows us then really to look into a lot of use cases. But again, for me, it's not only about the AI, it's really about looking at it holistically, right? So that you really also understand, we were talking about scoring, for example. Scoring just gives you a, a simple insight into, let's say, what customers should you address. But what you need to establish is basically an, a follow-up process that's happening on the business side, so that basically the customers that you identify, you indeed bring them on, right? Mm. Or when we talk about fraud management, right? Also here, by right, the scoring, I mean, it's a very common practice here, right? You have identified indeed the customers that might show some fraud and sus some suspicious cases, customers show fraud and perhaps fraud and behavior, but you need to have the right processes then to to, to to do the right follow-up activity later on right and i think that is really something that people um, maybe don't consider as a as a big aspect for, from you know by, because ai for many people still is, is a big buzzword right um yeah. and for me it's really that you need to fit you, you need you need to think from end to end about it right and okay. that is uh, sure. maybe some yeah, actually, I want to interject a very controversial but actually interesting topic as a follow-up to this. Uh, actually, when I hosted the prior panel, right, 
uh, people were talking about using AI to improve uh, customer experience, to gain more customer. They want to improve risk assessment. They want to improve in internal operational efficiency. And one of the conversation I had with uh, Visha even earlier, I think it actually very inspired me very much. It's about this interesting topic of when I do not need money, uh, the bank will want to give me money. When I need money, the bank will not give me money. <laughs> You know what I'm trying to get to? I think how can we use AI to solve this uh, gap of understanding between the customer and the institution where the people needs the money are actually given the money to build their business or to live a lifestyle where they actually can afford. But I think that is where uh, the traditional banking with the retail uh, on the offline may not be able to do that right now. With digital banking, I think there are a lot of things can be done using AI technology. So I like to open up this topic because I think this is a topic that I felt is actually has a good social purpose. Also is where the digital transformation of the bank and financial institutions should be targeting, especially for a major market like Indonesia with lots of young, uh, unbanked and uninsured, right? So I think with a lot of digital native as well. Maybe I'll have uh, Visha kind of opening up on this thing and the rest of you can just jump in. Feel free, right? This way. right. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah. So, just to give you a brief background on that, like, so we we coming from the technology background, uh, we took the bank and then we were uh, uh, creating the uh, creating the products out of it. Right. So, how we looked at it, one is the credit side, which is the asset side of the bank, and one is the collecting money, yeah, the uh, liability side of the bank. And how can technology impact lives, and how can it uh, impact lives over there uh, in terms of credit? So which we mentioned that the scoring can do something. And why we say need and want is like, if you ask a traditional bank's uh, credit analyst, which loan would you approve? And if you have ever applied for the loan, you would remember that you have to prove to the credit analyst that you have enough cash flow and your net worth is quite large. I Means according to the, your loan amount application, you practically don't need the money. So then your loan will be approved. But if your cash flow or the network doesn't show, then you don't get the money. But our customers, we are targeting the customers, which is in the middle, and they are always in, in the need. So, so that is how the, we devised our mission statement to provide banking to those who need and not only those who want. So that, that's the background of it. Thank you then, very much, Vish. Yeah, go ahead. Continue. Right, continue. Right. So then and that is how from the lending, then when we were moving to the liability side of the product before launching the digital banking, we did not want it just to be another bank. And we always uh, wanted to do financial inclusion. We talked to many of the uh, like politicians and industry players in this. Usually even though financial inclusion comes across as having a bank account. But we uh, found in our survey that sometimes you give them an incentive to open a bank account that I'll give you 100,000, 200,000. They open a bank account and next day they bring back again, uh, their amount and they still operate cash. Yeah. So bank account actually doesn't help in financial inclusion. So how, how would it help? And that's where, when we saw that, how do they manage their cash flow? And that's where it is different. Like we, when we have to plan for something uh, in this panel, in this forum, we would usually plan it on our favorite tool, spreadsheet. Yeah, we will have a predictive income. We know how much to expend and we can plan it. But our target segment who are, whose income is unpredictable, who are just like a small business owners and all, how do they plan? They don't have a spreadsheet yeah. So how do they plan? And that's where the beauty comes in. So they also plan it. So when we went to their houses, we saw they have like something known as jar economy. Yeah? So there are few jars kept at their place. One will be called education. One is called food. One is emergency. They come home, whatever they have got, they put something. They have their own system. They will put something in each jar. And that's how they manage it. Now, think from that person's point of view, when that person goes to a bank and opens a bank account, what happens? The, all the jars are merged, yeah? And it is now one account number. And that person has to manage. And without spreadsheet, it's practically impossible for that person to manage. And that's the reason bank account, banks uh, for this person's need, bank isn't much helping. And, and that is where we created the banking app where it is more, it's jar. So they can get any number of jars and accordingly manage their finances. In addition, we asked them uh, millennials that uh, you, you got a very bad reputation in the market that uh, seems like you people want to just spend. 
uh, is it so you don't want to save or what? But uh, to our surprise and positive surprise, most of the millennials say that they want to save, but they have a huge amount of peer pressure. Yeah, it's Instagram world after all. And there is a lot of offers, buy now, pay later, buy now, pay later. So by the time I realize my money is over and I need money, so I want to save, but how do I save? And that's where we thought that, how can we enable them to save? Now, saving, as we all know, like from the, from the works of Kahneman and all, that it's a habit and it's a very difficult habit to form. So can technology, can AI help them to form that habit? And that's the question based on which we, we kept an AI in our banking app, which analyzes the spending of the person and the income of the person and nudges them at the right time. So person will receive a notification uh, that, hey, listen, you are possibly a bit ahead of your expenditure. So maybe today it is better to eat at home. Don't go out to eat. So that nudging at the right time helps them because that, deci that uh, decision is a small decision to make and it helps them. And slowly, slowly, uh, this will form a habit and the pattern will improve their life. So, so that's, that's how we are. Yeah, yeah uh, Visha, I mean, what you're talking about is that you're looking at banking in terms of how, what kind of social impact you have on people's life. I, I think that is incredible. I'd love to have the rest of you uh, want to chip in on your opinion on this one. Who wants to uh, sh uh, chip in? Uh, oh, okay, Kirill, go ahead. Yes, you so, can raise your hand, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's possible in the Zoom or not because we use Teams, so I just, yeah. So so from my perspective uh, or from perspective of home credit, basically I, I fully agree that we need to focus on the middle people, right? People who have money, well, they will not want to get money, right? People who don't need, uh, People who have desperate need of money, they probably will not be able to pay back, right? And this is um, negative for us and for the client. So I believe this is what AI can really help the people, right? Because we are trying to, uh, the, the, the more we know about the client and more better are our model, we can help people not to get into some debt, right? Because this will mm -hmm. stay in your credit bureau. This will stay for you with you forever, basically, if you ever went to debt, maybe then, you know, so basically, I think it's interest of us and our client for us not to collect from them, right? Because it will save our costs, it will save the client uh, reputation, right? So I believe this is a big help of AI. And also, I would like to mention risk-based pricing, right? So uh, in some products, we are trying to price the products in a way that it's fair, right? So people who are less risky, we give them better pricing, right? People who are more risky, well, as we are not charity, we'll have to compensate with a higher price, but we still give them. And people who we don't believe will ever pay us, we simply don't give it to them, right? So it's not, mm. not to burden them and not to burden us. Okay, good. And uh, Sunny, you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, I think this is interesting because uh, when we look at this perspective, we are looking at perspective of retail that uh, as an individual, uh, you have possible income or you don't have possible income. Or we divide into two, bankable and non-bankable or unbankable. If, if you look at from, from I don't want to be too, too detailed on theory, but the microeconomy point of view is that we have what we call as an econometric uh, marginal propensity to save and marginal propensity to, to consume. Mm -hmm. Basically, we look at the populations of people here. This is what, what also we, we, we do it in, in, in Maybank. If you, if Sony's got increased salary from 100 to 110, what would Sony do with the 10 rupiah or 10 pound? Mm. Is it going to be saving or consume? And that is when we have a few millions of data and then we have that numbers, as it tend to be either up or down on one of those MPC or MPS, as consume or save. If the highest is in the saving, then it may answer some of the questions that we saw raised earlier. Then we can put the product there. But that's on the indicator. The biggest question is, where are they? And this is when we're talking about the addressable market, goes down mm. into targetable market, the arm length target. How can you calculate that? What GDP within that area? We can mm. go into that deeper. But yes, I don't want to go into detail on that uh, perspective, okay. but that's a re the retail side of the business. For the non-retail side, 
or business or, or uh, the moms and pops that also usable the approach can be usable you know the smes for example for certain level you can use that but slightly higher than that sme plus and above that will be tricky mm. we need to come back into the uh, uh, the old fashioned style of scoring what well, uh, part of it is the risk based pricing the higher mm. the risk you know it will it's going to be a higher price, <laughs> of course. That's right. <laughs> We're going to look at that. So that, that's just my two cents. Thank you. I, I see. Interesting. Uh, Alex or yes. Dr. Griffin, you want to share something? Yeah. Yes, I would like to share that, uh, something I learned from the insurance side, right? So I think what we see, and I mentioned it before, right? So when it comes to insurance in Indonesia, I think we really see a huge potential. And I think each, each uh, yeah, market player here knows that very well, right? So, but of course, it's really about, I mean, it's a matching the customer's needs, right? Really understanding a bit of the, you know, like the, the customer journey and also then to see, okay, what is really possible, right? And I think insurance, again, is still kind of a, um, yeah, not a commodity, right? So, and and we are, we are really facing that challenge that we really need to say, and we were, talked, we were talking about that at the beginning. So for us, it's not only about understanding how can we onboard new customers, right? But how can we also, especially in these difficult times as of today, how can we ensure that we actually can also keep the customers uh, in, in our portfolio, right? And then see, okay, especially now, for example, where you have an, an increased awareness in terms of health insurance, just perfect example, I think, right? Now with our COVID situation here, um, so really the awareness about health insurance is really increasing among the people, right? And that you use this then as an opportunity to, to really say, okay, so uh, what kind of customers could you identify that might really have an interest in that? And, and then again, right, have the right processes in place to follow up on that. But of mm. course, this is then the balance that you need to find between there's a business opportunity and what you should really do from a risk, from a risk perspective, right? Mm. Sure, I understand. Uh, 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 Doctor Green, before I get to you, I want to let the audience know if you have any question, please go ahead and uh, and uh, submit so that we know how many questions we need to allocate time for. Uh, Doctor Griffin, you want to uh, participate in these questions before I move sure. on to the yeah. last topic? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I probably just want to add, you know, a um, little bit about you know progressing towards the financial inclusion in order to grasp, you know, to grab the other, you know, uh, like unbanked segments before. And I think uh, in the you know BR case, uh, since uh, in in the beginning we kind of already have like a you know last networks uh, you know of like you know sales officers uh, relationship manager to the customers. Like I think uh, one 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 aspect that uh, we uh, actually try to improve or to exploit here is actually the human in the loop aspect with the AI itself, where we have a huge uh, you know knowledge about you know the customer to. Uh, you know, sales officer relationship and the knowledge in terms of, you know, uh, providing the products and also probably, uh, you know, knowing the customers uh, their self. And then because although we have actually have a large amount of data that we can analyze and then make a good, uh, you know, maybe scoring or providing profiling models in order to, you know, uh, be like the, the lead management system that I mentioned before, but uh, we, actually try to approach this with the hybrid way in a way that uh, the, the human knowledge is also important from the uh, sales officer or relations, relation manager uh, perspective that if they have the new knowledge from, from, from in the field, from, from the actual customers, uh, you know, either from the micro segments or from, from the wholesale segments or from the, you know, like the consumer segments, uh, they can actually, uh, you know, uh, also involve, involve in the, you know, improvement of the AI model itself that we haven't acquired before. So the lead management system is actually uh, keep improving or getting better in order to understand the customer uh, better than before uh, due to the you know, human in the loop process here. Okay, I see, good. I think the, the, I mean, with the digitization, having the human element involved in making some of the decision also important. In fact, I was just having a discussion online actually with different people about you know, human, computer, what is the right level of uh, balance in terms of AI, in terms of the fundamental technology. I, I like to, uh, we actually lost uh, Sunny. <laughs> Somehow, I think uh, this is the lack of reliability on online. <laughs> so I like to move on to an interesting topic. Uh, 
actually interrelated to this because we, what we have covered just now was, I think, the purpose or the direction, right? How we want to use AI in the banking industry. Of course, we have only limited time. I do want to cover one topic is about how do you work with a fintech company? Uh, and of course, in the case of Visha, he actually started as a fintech uh, going to acquire a bank, right? I thought that was a, a marvelous story I've heard. Right? I think one of the interesting story, right? So I know that, uh, for example, there are a lot of, uh, uh, as you know, banks are he heavily regulated, right? Or the financial institution, right? So you also have your, your strength. Uh, also, you have a weakness in the sense, right? So now we also know that fintech, uh, uh, actually fintech uh, company are more agile and flexible. Yeah? So of course you can tap into technology from the powerhouse like the US, China, and many other many institutions. So I'd like to hear from you all, I know in the, the controversial topic, maybe it's no longer controversial, is that fintech and bank should be working together and leverage each other. I'd love to hear from you all uh, what is the right way of doing it? And I, I actually hope to see more fintech company work in the major bank, especially in Indonesia. So maybe uh, again, uh, uh, who want to start first? Uh, okay, I take it. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Hey, yeah, sure, that's so what you're doing, bit. Alex. We, we think yeah, that's that. fine. That's fine. So I will be done the first one. So yes, indeed, we already worked with a few fintechs. I mean, I will not share the names here. Uh, but uh, so indeed, we have uh, embarked on that journey uh, last, last year, right? Especially like uh, in the in the data domain, uh, and also when it comes to uh, let's say really developing solutions together, right? So this really comprises, of course, again, right? I'm talking about often the, the three pillars. Uh, so here we are really talking about the, the operational processing as well as uh, sales onboarding, right? And that works very well, right? And I think there is also kind of a really like a big learning for both sides, right? So on the one hand side, of course. As well, you have, you have these new startups, uh, young companies, uh, they bring along the agility, right? So, and I think it was Sony that talked about it, right? We were com we are coming, we, I mean, Allianz is in the market here for more than 30 years, right? Um, so it's a big ship that you want to move around now, right? And uh, and of course, well, that is a challenge in itself, right? So you don't really need to talk about AI and, and, and what's the right approach, et cetera. It's really like also the, the culture. Again, we talked about the data, data quality, governance, et cetera, aspects, right? And this is, a, I think, uh, like a learning then for us, right? But again, uh, right, we bring it along the data, right? Which might be then of benefit for the partner, right? And uh, so, yeah, so we have really good experience with that. And uh, yeah, and of course, it's really for me, uh, you know, uh, enjoyable, uh, right, to, 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 to collaborate with them. And uh, so, yeah, for, so for me, uh, that is a journey that continues. And if you talk, to, um, or if you would like to know about one special topic, for example, something that I would like to address in the second half of the year is to think about solutions like uh, speech to text and text mining. Right. Oh, so okay. that's, that's something that I find super interesting. But where I also again face this common challenge that most of us have, that we often operate only with a small team, right? So because I think uh, um, having the right skills uh, in the company, that is one of the big challenges that most of us face. And uh, of course, that's why we try to leverage uh, right on, on on additional people skills, right? And you bring in then external support, so to say. Right. Okay, right. Alex, thanks for sharing your needs. I think that uh, one the audience, especially on the audience, may have a lot of fintech company. What you have mentioned may be just a statement, may be meaningful to a lot of them. What you're saying that you need, okay. may need a text-to-speech company, right? I'll introduce some to you at a future point, right? Okay, so, uh, good, to yeah, know, I, good to know. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. exactly. It's I think one we want the examples, the... right? So, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but because you, you see it. You have this yeah. challenge that we don't have that skill set. And of course, you hope then that, that, that an external company, a partner, right, can bring that in. Right? Yeah. As I mentioned, we, we, we want to hold a panel. We want to benefit uh, the bank as well, the, the, the participant, also all the people who are attending, right? Hopefully, we can make something happen offline. That's my goal. Huh? So I think uh, for the fintech question, right, I think we have different combinations. We have the big guy, like Bank Riot and all, uh, Maybank, and, and uh, Alliance, you are actually big company. You may look for big fintech to work with, right? And I think uh, also at the same time, like uh, Visha, who is actually from a fintech acquiring a bank, you know, I think it's the other way around. You know? Then we also have Kirill, which actually started as a traditional lending. Now they get offering a lot of uh, fintech uh, services. This is my understanding. Love to hear from uh, 
uh, Visha or Kirill uh, about this perspective about fintech and big bang, you know, for example. All right, I can, I can, yeah. So uh, with the big banks, I think uh, uh, if you see on paper, big banks have everything. Yeah, fintech actually shouldn't have existed because financial technology both were always there with the bank. Yeah? Banks were always ahead in technology. If you think about it, they had the ATM, they had the online internet banking, and everything that it was there. So, so what, what happened? Right. So happened what is that in terms of the consumer expectations with the like uh, let's say iPhone, if you can uh, you can say at the time with the WhatsApp type of experience and all the customer expectations started changing and they mm. wanted the financial products also with the similar experience. Yeah. So in that's in in nutshell what changed. Okay. Okay. Cool. Now. So, so banks, uh, what the issue which the banks face, yes, there were some kind of legacy technology and some also uh, a belief within the bank. Just three years back, you would talk and data is the most valuable thing one would say, yeah, that uh, this is my data. Any financial institution you talk to, this is my data. I would not want to share and data is very valuable. But today, actually, data is not valuable. Data is available. And down the line, three, four years, each and every data, everybody will be having it. So data won't be there. Then, okay. uh, so, so what you would need is somebody who can make sense out of that data, like AI, that is where you would uh, be ready to partner with somebody who would make sense out of that data. Okay. Today, another issue which the banks are facing is this is my customer. Same thing, which they were thinking about three years back, that this is my data. Today, most of the banks are thinking still that this is my customer. And down the line, three, four years again, it is nobody's customer. Open banking is there. Exactly. So it will be there. So again, it is, it is, that's that mindset change, which is more important or else why everything is there with the bank. So, so more we can service the, meet the customer needs, we would need to realize as an institution that uh, the, the way the technology is moving, we will have some specialized knowledge and we have to only think about the business model and how we can serve our customer better so, so as an example, what we would like to do, we are good in something, but we know that IoT is the thing going forward. Yeah. So if I would make a company which is good in collecting IoT data and I can use in my scoring and also in my uh, digital banking, because IoT can help in digital banking, right? So if some company is doing that better, I would love to partner with that. So that, that's, how, uh, that's how I would see the going forward thing. Okay, thank you, Visha. Uh, I still want to have the rest of you answering the fintech and bank co uh, question. I will actually ask for extension of five more minutes, okay, for this panel. We're running out of time. So each of you, let's have a one minute answer. Then we have one question for the audience, not the answer before we wrap up. Go ahead, uh, Mohammed. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, probably correct me if I'm wrong, Visha, because uh, one of the biggest, you know, probably advantage from the fintech side uh, compared to the corporate bank is um, it's kind of like doing the unbundling the bank service, uh, especially on the front end side where they do really good job on the customer experience sites uh, that actually bank is probably like, you know, uh, wait a little bit behind, you know, before they start thinking about digital transformations. Uh, my point here is actually, uh, since uh, this, the strategy now is actually going through the, I believe that probably most of the banks here actually have the vision for the digital transformations that, you know, now seeing um, from the exploration perspective, fintechs now is actually always be like, you know, uh, uh, the good collaborators, good partnership in order to, you know, expand the ecosystem that actually try to fill the gap from the, you know, customer, uh, you know, demand driven or customer driven view uh, point of view so that we can actually serve the customer better than before. And while we try to also integrate with our core banking system uh, from, you know, the, like uh, um, the traditional way that actually uh, FinTech didn't start with in the first place. And then in this case, we actually also try to uh, build some kind of an open API system, uh, you know, technically in order to integrate, uh, you know, more in the, you know, the core banking surface, uh, like a payment or lending, and then integrate that to the front end line that actually FinTech is, has like, uh, you know, probably a better surface than the traditional bank. So we actually have like more, um, you know, uh, harmony, I think in, 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 at the moment. And then we actually also have like some partnership as well with the FinTech, you know, you know 
from the payment lending and also you know like you know just um try to um redirect from our service to the fintech service uh, so that the customer actually has a better journey than before or something like that okay thank you thank you uh sunny or kirill you want to comment on this yeah i think from my point of view uh again uh fintech uh as mentioned by alex earlier that have the advantage of uh, being agile so the agility is the you know the prominent you know figures of this uh component so if if you look at the bank uh this again i mentioned about the boat earlier uh fintech as a boat and we uh, traditional banks as a, a tanker we cannot you know maneuver very quickly if you want to do that it's going to be havoc everywhere with the you know the the, the the back system you know all the front and and so on that it's not ready for that however this this is the the need the uh, the time the era it does work with change and it accelerated by the 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 fintechs sporadically uh, turn up everywhere mm. Mm. and then cater something that bank thinks are oh, that you are we're not going to cater for you but they cater for them so this is the experiment that bank never uh, touched before it's touched by the fintech earlier the experimenting on that side very easy easy okay to maneuver nice. and so on because of the regulation is not there yet at that time uh, but bank we cannot do that so this is i think the the, the good thing of this uh, as as mentioned by uh, muhammad ikifari i think mm-hmm. it should be Uh, as a symbiosis mutualism that yes. we can, you know work from each other or learn from each other uh, okay that is going forward that's what i can see that we and macbank also work with the, some of the fintech excellent i can't can put any name <laughs> I, i like the way you mentioned it's a symbiotic relationship and that is you can look at fintech as an experiment to do trying new thing just like what visha has done before they went to acquire a big big, big bang right <laughs> Kirill, you want to have one minute on this? Yep, sure. Before Basically, from us, we as Home Credit, we are somewhere in the middle, right? We are multi-financial institution, so we are not bank, we are not fintech. I like to think that we uh, are a, we are quite dynamic and agile, uh, that we can actually do the experimentation. So, for example, let's say uh, eight years ago when we joined Indonesian market, on when we started. The standard approval process took around days, right? Home credit straight wow. away did it in like one day, right? And now we have it in matter of minutes. Yeah. So Ex- so basically, we are really trying to innovate. Also, like putting new products, new technologies. I think we are quite fast adapters. Of course, not, not as fast as fintech. Uh, but, but here we are trying. But I would just mention that for me, like most focus where I'm. Uh, even I, I think will be even more disruptive will be the super apps right okay w- when they will start to uh, do potentially financing they have much better view for the customer right the customer opens their app very often whereas other apps not so often probably they have amazing data amazing relationship with customer so this is something where we are trying to also like cooperate more than fintech but of course with fintechs If there is anyone wanting to provide their solution, we'll be gladly to test it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Kirill. I actually have one question for the audience. I just want a one statement, a one word answer from each of you. The question is, what obstacle prevent bank from deploying AI capability at scale? Just give me one or two words answer. Who want to try first? What is the biggest obstacle to the bank adopting AI at scale? Give me one or two words. Mindset. 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 Okay, good. Another one. Yeah, resources and talent, I guess. Resources and talent. Yeah. And how about Kirill? Or Conservativeness. Alex? Conservativeness. Okay. How about Alex? No, I would agree with Sonny. So it's primarily about. It. So I, I like to take the resources or the skills from him to, okay. <laughs> to have your one word answer. <laughs> okay. How about Dr. Gifari? What is the biggest obstacle? Uh, it's a hard one because I, I got the last uh, <laughs> chance. To, um, probably trustworthiness from the people. Ah, huh? what from the people? Trust, the team. Trust, trust, trustworthiness. A trustworthiness. Trust. trust from the people. Okay, excellent. 
Well, I'm going to wrap up. We actually managed to answer the question so well and so short, right? I love this, right? I like the way we are doing the teamwork, right? So uh, thank you very much for all your participation. I really enjoyed the experience a lot. I actually, from this exercise, I learned about from all of you, the purpose of doing using AI for banking and service, uh, financial services. I learned from all of you. I'm going to summarize it and post it online. At the same time, I also understand what you think are the biggest obstacles, right? These are great uh, information. I hope all our audience will benefit from it. And uh, last but not least, actually, uh, I think FinTech company will love to work with the big bank. So I hope you all will open up and publish saying that what you need will bring all the FinTech and start working with you all. So both sides will work on the symbiotic relationship and benefit each other. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the audience for participation. Uh, Bhavana, I want to I'm going to pass it back to you, okay? Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. James. Thank you to all our event panelists for joining us and giving us your valuable time today. Thank you once again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Really enjoy Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye